So we'll just, just, as I say, give it, give it a few moments. Right, I think we should we should probably start, and, and I, ho I hope there will be more people uh, joining in shortly. Um, I think there are people are still sort of coming in in dribs and drabs. But um, uh, can I introduce myself? My name is Richard Dyer. I live in Falkirk. I'm a retired GP. Um, I'm a member of the Falkirk branch of Friends of the Earth Scotland, and um, I, I'm very glad to welcome the. Um, election candidates and um, I, I'll just read out the, 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 the names of the, the, the candidates who will be here. Um, w there, are, there are a couple of candidates who hadn't managed to join yet and I think at least one person was having some difficulty getting onto Zoom but we hope to have um, all seven people shortly. Um, the, the, so we have, uh, and I, I'll just say that um, we asked for uh, um, constituency uh, candidates where that was appropriate um, and um, from West Falkirk and from the East Falkirk constituency but also list candidates so we have got the five main parties um, here and uh, so that the, the people uh, who will be that the candidates we have got in the meeting are Neil Benny from the Scottish Conservatives, Austin Reid from the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Michelle Thompson from the Scottish National Party, Manette Gordon from Scottish Labour, Gillian Mackay from the Scottish Greens, Michael Matheson from the Scottish National Party, and Alison Black from Scottish Labour. Uh, can I just explain why they're in that particular order? In order to, to be fair to everybody, um, I thought it would be a good thing if the order of speaking was randomised. So I asked my excellent two of my excellent grandchildren to um, I gave them the names and asked them to produce a random list. And they have a a, a wheel of fortune at home, so they kind of spun, spun the wheel. And uh, so that so that that is the order that we will be asking you to speak initially. And what I will be doing is asking the candidates each to to talk for about four minutes, and we will be quite strict about the time keeping for, keeping for that. Um, and I've asked them to talk about, um, to include something about the sort of global um, climate emergency, but also some of the sort of local issues such as INEOS and plastic um, pollution and so on. Um, can I just, just mention a, a couple of sort of local things that, that um, this, the Falkirk branch of Friends of the Earth are taking an interest in, in particular. Um, we've got a, a, a campaign going called Living Within the Glow. And we've been um, asking people living in the sort of Falkirk Grange Mouth area within kind of sort of site of the Grange Mouth refinery to um, provide their sort of thoughts and impressions of what it's like living uh, n near to the, um, the biggest pol industrial polluter in Scotland. So if anybody's interested in that, there's, there's um, information available on, not on Facebook um, about living within the glow. Um, and we've also been aware of, I don't know if people have heard of nurdles, which are, are little plastic uh, bits of pollution that are a kind of a waste product of the, the plastics industry. And, and they kind of, you know, a lot, there are a lot of those in, in uh, around in, in the sort of on the beaches and so on around around Grainsmouth. Uh, and the other important issue coming up that I, I would like to people to sort of think about is is the COP26 uh, con climate conference that's coming up in Glasgow shortly. So um, I think that's that's really all I need to say at the moment. Um, so d it, so I think if I can ask people to start speaking, uh, do we have Neil Benny? Has he arrived? Uh, right, okay. Neil's still not here. Right, okay. 
So the next on the list is, is Austin, Austin Reid from the Scottish Liberal Democrats. So can I hand over to you? Yes, good evening. <clears throat> My name, as has been said, is Austin Reid. I'm the candidate for the Liberal Democrats in West Falkirk, Falkirk West, but I actually live in Falkirk East in Bowness, very close to Grangemouth. So what happens in Grangemouth affects us here a lot. I'm a member of the uh, Bowness Community Council, and we're very concerned with the all sorts of aspects from, from Grangemouth and Ineos. Um, the background, um, I can say very simply, is I think on many of these issues, I anticipate we are be saying very much similar things from all the parties. We're all very keen on a better environment, uh, but let me speak personally for a little bit. As far as I'm concerned, the environment is crucial, not just for me, I'm getting on in years, but for my children and my children's children. So I look at my, my the generation following and say, I and the people around me have got a responsibility in allowing a world for the next generations, which will survive, which will provide a good living for them, but which will be there and operational. So the Lib Dems are establishing what they say is a nature, nature emergency. They say it's no longer possible to deal with this with the little bits and pieces. So we're introducing a whole series of policies, everything from more trees to actually better emissions for cars, or much stricter controls to more um, housing, which is going to be energy efficient. So we're going to introduce far more houses and convert them using various forms of new technology and we're investing in new technology. So we're trying to cut down very drastically the energy needs. We're concerned about energy pollution, polluters like Grangemouth, but at the same time, it's not Grangemouth so much which pollutes, it's the people who use the energy from there which causes the pollution. So we're trying to shift the source of the energy to actually um, um, non-carbon based. So we actually use, um, everyone who uses energy is using one which uses much less carbon and that's everything from houses right through to cars. <clears throat> and the other side has been alluded to by the chairman is the use of waste. I think the waste is not properly handled, and I'm thinking of our local area. I don't think its waste is, 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 is sorted properly. I don't think the mechanism to actually ensure that the waste is not just sent abroad and that it actually is dealt with and recycled. And I think um, one of the things which the Lib Dems are trying to do is put more responsibility into local areas and actually have things working together in a local community area. And I think that's one of the things which could help enormously in our care of this world and in how we deal with energy and with waste and with housing. That's all for me. Thank you very much. That, that, was, that was excellent, um, a good start. And I, I think that um, perhaps just, just to sort of um, introduce a, a kind of a, a sort of positive note to the whole thing, that um, I've been looking at some of the um, the man manifesto commitments from all the, the, the main parties in Scotland, and they and uh, you know that you all have um, quite quite a significant amount of attention devoted to the environment. So I'm very pleased about that, but <laughs> never quite enough, and it's always a matter of not just um, you know what you do, but actually how you do it and putting the money into it. But anyway, that that was that was fine. Okay, um, I think we'll move on to uh, Michelle Thompson, please, from the Scottish National Party. Well, good evening, and and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, this evening. I'm going to talk about something slightly differently because obviously we've got Michael Matheson here this evening who will be able to really do a superb job of covering the SNP manifesto, one that I'm fully signed up to and I believe it is its scale of ambition around the challenge of climate change is excellent. What I want to talk about tonight is to make a few remarks about how our financial systems inhibit our uh, appetite and our ambition for climate change. So I'm just going to run through a few points. Now, gross domestic product or GDP is still the international measure of growth, but we know this is crude, ineffective and neglects contribution. So therefore we must be careful about the terminology of using the term green growth. It came to prominence uh, based on an article by Ban Ki-moon uh, in 2009. And that was off the back of two things happening. One, 2009, the second warmest year since 1880. 
and the year when most of the, the world went into recession after the financial meltdown of um, September 2008. And you might say, well, what has that got to do with what we're talking about this evening? But the term that connects them together, growth and more specifically economic growth and now green growth being at the forefront of climate change can be viewed as a contradiction because growth and the activities around growth have been pinpointed as one of the main triggers actually of climate change, environmental depletion and growing social inequalities. And this is actually a paradox. And as Kate Rothworth said, she of donut economics, today we have econ economies that need to grow, whether or not they make us thrive, but what we need are economies that make us thrive, whether or not they grow. It's my belief, therefore, that we must talk about sustainability that, yes, encompasses green growth, but also good political governance and is enabled and supported by our financial systems. Now, perhaps arguably sustainability are best depicted in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They are the Bible, if you like. But I want to just make a few more remarks about our financial systems here this evening. I, I'm an ambassador of the a Westminster based group, the all party parliamentary group for fair business banking. Now that's a throwback to my days as an MP. And it was set up to try and influence the UK government after the quite disgraceful way some of the banks treated small businesses. In terms of financial systems, the UK has a major problem. The City of London's fat, bloated and deeply corrupt. It's now regarded as one of the money laundering capitals of the world. And unfortunately that can only be encouraged with some of the loosening of rules as a result of Brexit. Governments in the form of regulation is centred in Westminster. And the UK has a particular problem with a lack of regulation and loose tax laws. For example, the current estimate of tax unpaid by the UK Treasury of legitimate schemes, not tax avoidance, is around £32 billion. So that would, could be £2.6 billion available extra to Scotland if it was collected. You might say again, why should we care? And we have to, if this is one point I want to make this evening, our financial system, first of all, our global financial system has a significant ability to put a blocker on all our ability to combat climate change. Globalization and oligarchs still carry enormous sway above nation states. Our UK financial system is corrupt and we in Scotland, despite our Scottish government, have little or no sway over that financial system. Ethics as part of sustainability and ethics of how we do our business are vitally important. And I would say that I believe that the Scottish government and the SNP are streets ahead in trying to use the powers we do have to try and affect change. I'll finish with a short example. As an example of the need of how regulation can affect company activities that then link to climate change, I'll give you a short example. Scotland has a product regulated by Westminster called Scottish Limited Partnerships. Now, the Scottish government has no control over these because it resides at Westminster. But if I look today in readiness for this debate to find a, a, an example of a Scottish Limited Partnership, I came up with one called Astrade Solutions. It's an active Scottish limited partnership registered in Tinto Street in Edinburgh. It was formed in 2013. It's never published any accounts to this day, yet it's still registered active at Company's House. It's got no directors listed. To remain active, it must have one person of significant control. The person is Mr. Sergey, and I'm not sure I'll pronounce this correctly, Nidash. 6.2 appointment 132 Vasily Kozhinov Street, Moscow, Russia. Now, what they trade is asbestos. They've been asbestos, as you know, has been banned in the UK for over 20 years. But Astrade Solutions trades in this product. And the Times reports alone in 2015, Astrade Solutions shipped 35,000 tons of asbestos valued at 13.67 million. That is from a product that is registered in Scotland and regulated by Westminster that is doing enormous damage. So the point of what I'm saying this evening is that whilst we may look at what is happening on our doorstep, we cannot lose sight 
of our financial and regulatory systems. And just to finish off in terms of INEAS... Yes, yes Michelle, can you, can you make it brief? Because right. so you've, you've had your four minutes. <laughs> I know we're going to come on to that this evening. I've made my key point about financial systems and lack of control. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, um, I, I gather that Alison Black has managed to um, join finally after a lot of problems. So welcome, Alison. Um, can I just say that you... Uh, I've sort of explained that we've kind of randomised the order that people are being asked to speak and, and you'll be last, but that's just the way you are in the order. So the next person is, um, can I ask Manette Gordon from Scottish Labour to speak next, please? Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to hearing about all the views everyone has and sharing some of my own as well. Um, just a, a little bit of personal information first. Um, I'm a candidate for Falkirk West. Um, I'm standing as a candidate because I want to make things better for people here and throughout Scotland. Uh, I grew up near Falkirk. I, I moved here in 2006, having visited the area throughout my childhood, and I loved it. Um, so we're fully settled here and we can't imagine living anywhere else. Um, but what's been quite sad is to see uh, the demise of our town centres. And that's one of my main focuses and what we do to bring them back to life. Uh, but part of that recovery, it really needs to take into account initiatives to re reduce emissions and improve sustainability. And this seems to be the ideal time to be almost starting again after the pandemic with a fresh perspective on what we can do um, to both improve the town centres and from a business and also an economic perspective, but also to have climate change at the heart of our new plans. Uh, new ways of working during the pandemic have, have shown we can work in more flexible ways. Home working might, not, might be a good solution for many, but some might find it a bit isolating. A, a good compromise could be things like co-working spaces in our town centres where people can work collaboratively with others without having to travel back and forth to cities every day. This could certainly breathe life back into town centres, but also reduce congestion on our main roads not to mention improving lives for people, giving them more time to spend with their families. Now, just moving on to the sort of the topics that were, were mentioned, um, INEAS is obviously a concern in the area in terms of emissions. Um, certainly a Scottish government uh, report found that 75% of all emissions from industries studied come from three sectors, one of which is, is oil and gas. And six out of the seven largest sites are within 50 kilometres of Grangemouth. Uh, carbon capture and storage is expected to be the main technology used for decarbonisation um, for these sectors, and that could provide around 60% of emissions reduction. Um, to encourage these changes, though, economic incentives need to be put in place, and decarbonisation options have to be adopted quickly. Um, the next thing was the plastic pollution issue, which certainly is a problem for all. Um, with at least 8 million tonnes of plastic, which ends up in our oceans every year, and this is devastating for marine life. Um, plastic pollution is a threat to food safety as well. Coastal tourism, and it contributes to climate change, as we know. The recycling and reuse of plastics and support for research and innovation to develop new products to replace single-use plastics are definitely needed. Um, it, but the wider issue is, of course, the, the global problem, uh, particularly with other countries contributing so much in terms of emissions. Um, Glasgow hosts the, the UN Climate Change Co Conference in November 21, and that will bring together world leaders uh, to commit to urgent global climate action. We have to build relationships to encourage agreement on these issues and to find common solutions to protect our planet and create a greener, more sustainable future for all of us. In the UK, people are already doing their bit in climate change, from work on offshore wind farms, powering homes and businesses, to local initiatives, which encourage children and parents to walk to school. We have to keep up the momentum and we have to inspire more people to join them. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing all the discussions tonight and listening to people's concerns and thoughts on those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monette. Um, right, uh, now we move on to our next speaker, who is Gillian Mackay from the Scottish Greens. 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me along this evening. So my name is Gillian Mackay. I'm the Scottish Greens lead candidate for the Central Scotland list. I grew up in Grangemouth along the end of Bowness Road that is very, very close to Ineos. So Ineos is one of the <laughs> Ineos is probably one of the main interest topics within <laughs> within probably what we're going to cover tonight. But I'm also a marine biologist, so um, nurgles and ocean plastic pollution is something that I'm very interested in as well. So as we know, we have nine years left to address the climate breakdown, and that's why this election, the Scottish Greens are asking for your vote and to vote like your future depends on it. In the last Parliament, the Scottish Greens were critical to securing an ambitious climate act that commits Scotland to reducing our emissions by 75% by 2030. Meeting this target, as we know, requires a fundamental transformation of our economy and society. That's why in our manifesto, we're proposing to invest 3.2 billion in public transport, including the first stage of our Real for All programme, which is a 20 year, 22 billion pound programme to renew our railways and support at least 16,800 jobs. We want to invest 3 billion in warm and zero carbon homes and buildings, leveraging 7.5 billion in private investment and creating over 70, 75,000 jobs. We want to invest £450 million in renewables, get a new deal for offshore wind and a support programme for the development of a world leading tidal sector, creating 10,000 jobs. And invest £895 million to re restore Scotland's natural environment, creating over 6,000 green rural jobs. As well as this, we know we cannot afford to burn the known reserves of North Sea, North sea oil and gas. But Scottish Greens want a just transition that ensures the valuable skills in the sector are not lost and that no worker is left behind. We need to transition into cleaner industries that will ensure stable, well-paid jobs with trade, re trade union recognition. I need to put my teeth back in. That lasts for generations to come. In our manifesto, we're calling on the Scottish government to stop the UK government, sorry, to stop issuing licenses for oil and gas exploration and development. Revoke undeveloped licences and instigate a review of current permits to assess whether the existing facil facilities should be phased out early through a just transition. In Falkirk, this means that we want to deliver a just transition for workers at Grangemouth. We do this by establishing worker-led transition boards, which would incorporate local communities, local government and the plant operator to develop a plan for phasing out fossil fuels and the delivery of new jobs and in industries and to develop an international research hub for zero carbon biochemicals processing at Grangemouth. This year obviously also sees COP, and as host nations, the Scottish and UK government must bring more than targets to the table if COP26 conference is going to be a success. We cannot allow sponsors to dictate the terms. This is why the last COP failed and the last people we want in the room are the oil industry and powerful vested interests from the most damaging industries to lobby a critical international summit. We must make the Glasgow COP as inclusive as possible, especially for those who are at the front line of dealing with impacts of the climate emergency. So I'm looking forward to all of your questions this evening and hoping for a very in-depth and technical discussion. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, sh I should have mentioned this earlier, but <clears throat> can I ask everybody who would like to ask a question of our uh, panel of candidates to uh, put the questions in the chat, and that's that way we can, and then they'll be passed on to to all the candidates um, after this initial session. So um, the next person on the list is Michael Matheson from the Scottish National Party. Thank you, Richard, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for your invitation to join you here tonight for the Friends of the Earth uh, hustings. Um, this year has been a really challenging year um, for uh, everyone during the course of the pandemic. However, during the course of the pandemic, the climate crisis that we face has not gone away. And as we start to move out of the pandemic and hopefully in the months ahead, we need to make sure that we secure and sustain economic recovery, which will be critical to supporting our communities and our country as a whole in recovering from the economic damage that's been caused by the pandemic. But in doing that, it's absolutely essential that any recovery 
is a green recovery, making sure that we build upon some of the positive gains that have been achieved during the course of the pandemic, and there have been some, uh, particularly around issues relating to pollution, that we try to build upon them and sustain them going forward as we move out of the pandemic itself. As a country, Scotland has the most ambitious legal framework of any country in the world in order to reduce its emissions. Legally binding emissions that were taken forward by the Scottish Government and were approved by the Scottish Parliament. But that ambitious legal framework will also require transformative policies in order to deliver the legal obligations which we now have to meet. And in order to do that, it's essential that we take forward the range of policies that can support us and assist us in achieving that. That's why uh, the Climate Change Update Plan, which was published just back in March by the Scottish Government, set out 100 new policy areas that will be taken forward in order to take us on the pathway to achieving our 2032 target and to build upon that to move to our net zero target as a nation by 2045. Ranging from decarbonising our transport network to decarbonising our domestic heating system and through to investing in new technologies and in new energies, whether it be hydrogen, wind or tidal, all have a significant part to play in helping to support and sustain us going forward and to meet our global ambitions to be climate change leaders. But technology will only take us so far and some of the technology is not mature enough and is not ready to be able to deliver the type of transformation which is required at scale at the moment. And that's why behaviour change will also be important. People changing the way they go about leading their lives and how they go about doing things in order to help to meet our climate change ambitions. So that's why we've set out the target of reducing car kilometres by 20% by 2030 in order to make sure that we reduce the amount of car use in our country and in doing so, help to reduce the carbon output that comes from that. And taking forward the introduction of low emission zones in our major cities in order to tackle air pollution and to tackle the problem of polluting vehicles. Allowing local authorities the powers, if they choose to do so at a local level, to introduce workplace parking levies as part of a congestion plan in order to reduce car use within towns and city centres. And alongside that, We've also invested record sums in active travel, doubling it over the course of the last couple of years alone, and the budget being doubled over the course of the last few years alone, helping to support people to be able to walk, cycle and wheel in a way which they want and to make sure that we have the level and nature of infrastructure that's necessary to support that. The meaning of the climate change, meaning of climate change challenge will be a significant one and one which will require us all to play our part. But we also need to make sure that we learn the lessons of the past, the damage it was caused to coal mining communities, steelworker communities, as a result of deindustrialization during the 80s and the 90s that left communities abandoned and scarred and badly damaged during the course of that transition. And that's why we will implement the recommendations of the Just Transmission Transition Commission to make sure that as we move toward becoming a net zero country, that we do so in a just way, ensuring that no communities and no individuals are left behind, but in doing it in a way that sustains all of our communities and makes sure that we achieve our objective of becoming a net zero nation by 2045. And on that note, I'll draw my remarks to our close, Richard. Thank you very much. And um, now I gather that Neil Benny from the Scottish Conservatives has um, still not managed to join us for I no idea why that is. So um, the, the final speaker is Alison Black from Scottish Labour. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? That's fine. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this evening to listen to what everyone has to say. Tackling global climate change is an urgent issue. We live with the threat of flooding and much of Falkirk East and our communities live alongside the industry, including the biggest uh, single emitter in Scotland. One of Scottish Labour's top, well, 
of top five priorities is achieving net zero emissions in Scotland and to spark a green jobs revolution through establishing a just transition board. Five years ago, we had a green industrial revolution at the heart of our manifesto. We didn't take power, but little has been done since then to press forward. With COP26 coming to Glasgow later in the year, we need to use this as a catalyst for change at all levels of government. The time is of the essence. In the next Scottish Parliament, we have to put the legislation and funding in place to make it happen. We have to think global, but act local, and that starts with properly funded councils. We can't be proactive if they're struggling to deliver basic services. Over the last 10 years in Falkirk, uh, we have seen over 150 million cuts from the SNP at Holyrood. Our party will adopt a local first approach to procurement. We will help councils to invest more in green spaces and to food growing places. Public transport is a good example of budget regarding budget cuts. Currently, you can't get back, uh, back to Slamanon after quarter past seven at night, and on a Sunday, you can't get a tour from Earthby bus. I'm an own driver and I do use public transport, and I think that 20 minute, minute neighbourhoods is a great concept. Last year during the pandemic, we really saw how, how inequalities affected communities, especially if you weren't a, a car driver. If you live in Madison, it was really difficult to get to your GPs or to, to go and get your prescription. We will invest in public transport, deliver more accessible, low emission buses, give under 25s free transport, support councils to run their own bus services, make rail, set, rail to travel more affordable and more accessible and will increase stations and uh, electrification. Our buildings produce huge amounts of emissions. Fewer than half of our homes are at any energy efficiency level C or higher, and a quarter of households live in fuel poverty. And that's, that's really clear to see in the breeze and in the earth. Labour will upgrade all homes to at least level C by 2030, will offer grants to low and middle income families and will offer also offer loans and will particularly target fuel pure, fam fuel, fuel pure households and rural households in the beginning. We'll create 200,000 uh, energy efficient new homes. Plastic pollution is a huge issue globally and we see the results for ourselves along the Bones foreshore. We'll move towards a polycarbonate ban and will require food manufacturers and retailers to reduce waste and alongside banning all single-use plastic. In days of old, locally, we all knew someone who worked in the old BP. Ineos is a very different company and the Grangemouth complex needs to be re-engineered, but attitudes also do as well. Nationally, we've lost over 8,000 jobs in the oil and gas sector and job losses are a big fear locally. Workers here are really ready for the challenge. They're up for change. They want to learn the new technologies. But as has been said already, we have to ensure that there's a just transition and that uh, while they're reskilling, that their jobs, paying, paying salaries, et cetera, are protected. And we've got the scientists and engineers in our country to make all this happen, but we just really need to get on with it. For too long, the, long the communities that live alongside industry have been ignored this can't continue. In Grangemouth and Bowness, we've got communities and people who are really willing to stand up and, and be counted. And if I'm elected, I will do the same. The cumulative effect of planning decisions needs to be reviewed, as decisions are often taken in isolation, and it's only later that the full impact of those decisions are realised. We can all do more. We could be using rain, shop local, shop in season, etc. We can all individually play our part. A vote for me is a vote for someone who cares passionately about this area, and Scottish Labour has a manifesto and the ambition to ensure that our communities become stronger and healthier, whilst at the same time we take the necessary steps to ensure our environment is protected for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you to all of you. Um, can I just um, make a, a, a wee point of my own before we get on to uh, questions? that um, I've been looking, at, obviously we have been receiving um, the party leaflets through the door of, about the, the upcoming election. And one of the things that I noticed about these leaflets is that they mention various things, in, in, including jobs and recovery from COVID and so on. But there's really, in, in all the leaflets we've had, there's been very little mention, if any, of the environment. And I think that this Suggest. I mean, I know that the leaflets are obviously designed to appeal to the, you know, the the the, the, the 
the local people that they're, they're being delivered to. But I think that um, I, I have a, a sort of personal feeling that um, we perhaps underestimate how much the general population are concerned about the environment and that, um, you know, I, th I think we all, including um, politicians, shouldn't be frightened to talk about it in, in, in public spaces. I think that's very important. Um, now, um, we've, we have got one or two uh, questions from the audience, but um, can I just start off by um, uh, uh, um, one question myself? Um, the, um, and that's this one, that the Scottish government has banned fracking in Scotland, and I think, you know, certainly in Friends of the Earth, we're, we're very happy about that. But Scotland is still importing large amounts of frack gas from abroad, and I w wonder if um, the net, you know if people would consider actually banning the Im importing of frack gas because you know wherever the fracking happens, it's not it's not good. Now, um, would would anybody any any of the candidates like to? Uh, should, should we maybe just sort of stick to the to the same same order? That's maybe the the simplest thing. So if um, uh, Austin, have you got anything to say on that one? Yes, I have. <clears throat> I think the issue is the use of fuels of any sort which produce carbon, whether it's fracking or oil or gas. These are ones which need to be cut down. And I think the way they're, they're being cut down has been rehearsed. Can I say, I think largely all the parties are in basic agreement that we've got to cut down carbon for our own survival. And can I say that my own party has got has got the environment as one of the key elements. And can I agree with Michelle in terms of what she was saying? Because the economy is the core of what's going to allow us to solve the problem about the environment. If we don't have an economy which is working, the environment cannot be solved. So I think we need to cut down the use of all things which produce carbon, whether it's fracking or oil or gas, and we need to change quickly and promptly, as fast as we can, into non-carbon emitting um, um, sources of, of energy. And these are clearly renewable, wind, um, wind, um, sea, and things like this. And we need to develop new technologies to actually harness these. So I think, yes, environment is absolutely crucial, but I think um, banning the import of, of fracking is only, a, is only a side issue. What we've got to do is stop the use of any energy sources which produce carbon. And another response, can I just also respond to something which, which Michelle said, you talked about GND, GNP as being the source of our economy. I think I've worked recently in a little country in the Himalayas, which is interested in gross national happiness. It's Bhutan. I helped establish a university there, and they're not concerned with the product, they're concerned with happiness, and it really is a life-changing idea that we should be concerned with our happiness, with our communities, with how we work, and not always try to grow and grow and get more and more expensive things. And this is really a transformative thing. And if a little of that could be brought back into Scotland, it might make all our lives, my life and everything else's life, that little bit happier because we'd be using less energy. Sweet. Yeah, uh, good, excellent. Yes, I think uh, ha happiness and, and happiness doesn't necessarily involve having lots of money. That's true. Uh, Michelle. Um, right. I mean, we've covered quite a, a, a few uh, areas uh, already, uh, but I'll go back to the, the question. Uh, now, uh, this is where, again, we get into the, the practicalities of it. What is the law? Is it reasonably is it feasible for the Scottish government to ban a private company from landing what it, it wants? Does it have the governance and control to do that? And in certain respects, that was the point I was trying to make earlier that I applaud the ambition of the SNP and the Scottish government, but there's very real practical areas where our ambitions are limited. So Ineos, for example, doesn't even have its headquarters in the UK anymore. It moved it to Switzerland in 2010 to save itself at that time an estimated £100 million in tax. So we also have an issue. This is an extraordinarily important company to the Scottish economy. We know it contributes 
about 4% uh, of GDP, but we have relatively little control over its governance in the UK. And another practical application is we could, if we were in charge of regulation, we could force companies to demonstrate how they were adhering to either, you know, arguably our national performance framework or the UN SDGs. So I don't know whether it's practical in law. I imagine it would need to be looked at. So it may well be theoretically desirable, but the lack of governance on governance capabilities in Scotland is really significant and limits our ambitions. And that's one of the reasons why I'm in favour of independence. Now, I know you might expect me to say that I'm an SNP candidate, but it's because it really puts a blocker on our ambitions. And Austin, just to pick up on your point about GDP, there's certainly been, to the best of my knowledge, over a thousand different measures that have been suggested as alternatives, but none of them is going to, yet going to fly. And part of that goes back to the issue around globalisation I was describing earlier. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Monette? Yeah, like thank to... you. Um, actually, the, the, the ban that there is um, currently against um, the unnatural gas extraction uh, process in uh, Scotland, I campaigned for that. Um, I was part of the, the group that um, went out and knocked doors and lobbied the um, Scottish government to put something in place to stop that from happening. So that was quite that was quite a long battle and, was in, and resulted in an inquiry and everything. It wasn't just an easy thing to do, but you know, obviously we got there. And I'm obviously against all of these kinds of methods. We shouldn't be sort of using methods like that to um, replace what, you know, other types of like dirty fuels. Um, so there certainly are other other options in terms of and producing energy in order to carry out the functions at Grangemouth. And I think what needs to happen is to be incentivize the, you know, the, the methods and make it work for the company that, you know, obviously they can see see the the benefits of doing this in order to have a sustainable long-term place in the world, if you like. Because without that, you know, these companies will cease to exist um, if they don't, you know, keep up and keep up with the, the new technologies that we need to adopt in order to stop producing so much carbon into our atmosphere. And um, so I, I can, you know, certainly the, the incentives could go a long way into persuading them not, not to do that anymore. And um, so that's the approach I would take. Thank you. Good, thanks. Uh, Gillian, have you got anything to say about this? So our manifesto makes a commitment to banning the importation of fracked gas. Um, we wouldn't have it in Scotland, so I don't see why we should be forcing problems we wouldn't want on ourselves onto citizens of other countries who are having their water polluted. In some countries, they're able to light their tap water because of the gas coming through it. I don't think that forcing that sort of in local environmental breakdown onto countries on the other side of the world, purely to su support an industry in Scotland is actually part of the sort of outward looking climate and socially just Scotland that I want to see in a few years. And I don't think it's in line with many of the young people I've been speaking to over this um, campaign. I don't think it's in line with their thoughts of a, of a Scotland in the future. So absolutely behind a ban on importation, whatever way we do it. Okay, uh, that's clear enough. Michael. So I think, um, Richard, the, the critical issue here is, is, um, is not so much the source of the actual gas, but it's actually it's about decarbonising our domestic heating systems. Uh, because if we don't decarbonise our domestic heating systems, it means that we will remain reliant upon carbon-based uh, fuel and energy for an extended period of time. So what's going to be critical here and what we have set out are very ambitious plans, as was set out within the Climate Change Update plan published just, as I say, back in March, set out very ambitious targets to decarbonise our domestic heating systems, which means people moving away from using normal gas as it is at the present moment and to using combi boilers, etc. They're looking to use alternative decarbonised methods. And one of the most obvious options is to look at using hydrogen. Um, as a, a source of uh, heating fuel for us and to use our domestic heating network 
as a means by which we can do that. There is a challenge here though, and the challenge is that Ofgem, the regulator, do not have an explicit requirement to ensure that they are delivering on net zero ambitions for 2045. It's not within their specific terms of reference. And the only way we can decarbonize the system effectively is if Ofgem give the go ahead and the regulatory clearance to start to decarbonize the network effectively beyond that of the household itself. And that is the actual supply uh, route itself. And the reason for that is because Ofgem are working to 2050. And that is the UK government's target for reaching net zero. And one of the things that came out um, just over a year and a half ago from the Infrastructure Commission for Scotland's report Alongside that of the Infrastructure Commission report in England, stating that Ofgem needed to change its regulatory function to be one which was much more regionalised and recognised the distinctive differences in different parts of the UK, and Scotland's a very good example of that. So one of the biggest inhibitors that we have in dealing with decarbonising our domestic heating system is a regulator that one, Scotland doesn't control, Two, is operating to a different timeline from what we are actually trying to achieve. And three, has not been prepared to operate in different ways in different parts of the UK to reflect different needs. And until that is addressed, we will continue to be inhibited in being able to make the speed and nature of change which will be necessary in order to decarbonise our domestic heating system. That, in my view, is a critical issue here. Because anything else, in effect, will not deliver the decarbonisation of domestic heating and energy that is necessary in order to meet our 2045 legal objectives, uh, ob uh, targets. Right. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, 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 I do kind of understand the frustration of not having control over things like Ofgem. Yes. Uh, Alison. Thanks. <coughs> I think that we have a lot of research going on. You know, we've got a we've got the UK level. We've got a hydrogen board. Hydrogen is one of the most about what's like it's the most abundant uh, chemical on the planet, and we have to we have to like you know we have to turn the research into the practical reality of using it as a, a an alternative source of energy. And I think we've got wind, we've got wave, we've got solar energy, and we need to use that more. And we also need to make sure that we're manufacturing. You know the, the the parts for for for, for those types of energy uh, here rather than importing them from abroad because it would create jobs and it would also obviously help with reducing emissions and transport etc. So I, I don't really have anything else to say about that, but I think that we need to just we really need to, to get a move on uh, because our workers and the industry needs it needs reassurance. It needs a practical way forward, and we, we definitely. We've got a lot of fuel poverty. We've got people in the braze paying over £100 a week for... Oh, we, we seem to have lost Alison, I think. Um, right, I think... Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's fine, okay. Sorry, we, we lost you there, Alison. Had you had you? No, when did you lose me? What, what was I saying? I, I was I talked about wind and solar and wind energy, and, and I said about it was just just a, a couple of minutes ago. I mean, I think uh... right. Uh, I talked I talked about wind and wave and solar energy and how we had to manufacture, we had to start manufacturing at home and how people in the breeze were. Uh, yes. Can you see your head all that? That's fine. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. Now we've we've had uh, quite a few questions from uh, our audience. Thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to to Kate, who's been keeping an eye on the chat, and we'll uh, kind of read out the, the the questions, and then we'll just go through the same sort of procedure. I think it seems to work okay. Do you want me to do one at a time, Richard? Okay. Um, so someone asked about just transition. So the candidates have mentioned just transition and there was a question about how long do we expect that transition to take and um, yeah, what, what can people expect um, in the meantime as on the way to that full transition to be implemented? 
Shall I? Okay. <clears throat> yes, yes, go ahead, go ahead, Austin. Thank and you. Can, can I just answer very briefly? <clears throat> the, there's an amendment to the recent Climate Change Act which specified that the reduction targets of 75% by 2030. So there is a particular target. And can I say thank you to Labour because that was an amendment brought in by the Liberal Democrats in conjunction with Labour. And can I just use that as an example? I think we'd only get these targets and get, get, get make progress if there is co consensus and agreement. This does happen in the Scottish Parliament. There's quite a remarkable amount of working across party lines to achieve this. And the example here is that particular amendment to the Act was brought in by Liberal and, and Labour. And it's this sort of thing which allow, will allow us all to actually achieve what are really hefty and, and remarkable targets. And that's one target, which is 75% reduction of emissions by 2030. There are other targets for other bits but these, these, are, these are fairly hefty targets and they're going to be difficult to achieve. And as I've been saying, it'll only work if we have a good resource uh, underneath. I'm not sure I agree with the idea that it's only because of the regulator which is preventing that happening. That is a hindrance, but it's not the real blockage. There are other blockages in terms of production and terms of people being prepared to have a little bit more difficult, difficult life and actually to introduce these other alternative changes. Yes, Richard, thank you. Back on that point. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, sure, Michael. Yeah, um, so it, it, I, I'm interested in Austin's point there about um, about the, the amendment around uh, the climate change legislation taking it to 75%. And I agree with him. We need to work on a consensual basis. But it also means that parties need to be big enough and mature enough to actually take forward the policies which are necessary in order to achieve those targets. Yes. Because the very same two parties that supported the 75% target, the Lib Dems and Labour, which we supported as well, yes. were both the two parties that completely opposed the idea of workplace parking levies being introduced as a measure that can help to support us in achieving our climate change ambitions. So it's very easy to set targets. It's much more challenging to take forward the policies that are yes. necessary in order to achieve those targets. Yes. Yes. And that's where all of the political parties need to be big enough and mature enough in this debate to be prepared to take forward the bold policies and the difficult policies which will be necessary in order to sustain the change that's necessary in order to meet our climate change ambitions. So if I had one appeal I would make to all of the parties here tonight is that let's not just set the targets, let's also live up to the policies which will be necessary to deliver that. And that's why we need to make sure in the next parliament it's not just about talking about the targets and whether they're being met or not, it's also about implementing the policies that will create the transformation that is absolutely critical to achieving them. Can I, can I add one thing, please? <clears throat> uh, can I agree with what's been said? I think in order to achieve a change, uh, especially a policy change, you need a number of things. And uh, Michael's mentioned most of them. You need, first of all, an aim. You need the idea intention, what it is. You need legislation or regulations which will enforce that or penalize people who don't, don't do it. So you need the aim, the strategy, you need the regulations, and then you need education to tell people how to do it. And I think the last one, and there are lots of forms of education, there's guidance, uh, all sorts of things. But the last one which is left out sometimes is you need an example. And I think I'm, I'm particularly struck with what's happening in England at present. We have, we should have a moral government and everything is moral, the regulations, but the, the, the final thing, there's no example. And I think quite often in both businesses, organizations, institutions, and companies, maybe even families, you have wonderful ideas, wonderful strategy, wonderful um, regulations, wonderful rules, but at the end, you don't have an example. So I think here is something which every organization in which we as members are party, are, are, are members, every organization, every company, we should be setting an example, each individually and the company, because it's by setting an example of reducing the carbon in our own particular thing, we are likely to carry it through. So government, local government should say, we are going to be part of this overall policy, the strategy of reducing, and we ourselves are going to do this as an example. So I think that's quite often, that's what is left out. We have all the plans, and yes, uh, Mike's quite right in terms of, we've got to actually implement it, that's difficult. But we also need to set an example. Thank you. Mm, thank you. I, I think we, we need to give somebody else a chance to, to talk. I, I, I certainly, I mean, I think that the, um, the, 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 the idea of, of this, of politics of, of the Scottish Parliament taking a collaborative approach and to, to achieve these things rather than 
um, kind of everybody being against everybody else. I think that's absolutely crucial. And I certainly encourage that. Michelle, I think you're next. Yeah, I think the question was uh, about a just transition um, rather than a transition. And so I think, for, you know, I, I would say emphasize the word a just transition and also for whom and arguably augment Michael's point about not just uh, political parties understanding that they're working and operating in what we aim to be a virtuous cycle where our, our, our planet, the precious resource for all of us is at the forefront of what we're considering. All the other stakeholders who are involved in decision making as well. And I've already seen, you know, I've been out and about meeting a lot of people in the constituency, and I keep coming across examples where I can see that individual stakeholders are doing their best to um, meet their own accountabilities and responsibilities, but they're quite clear like, this is my authority, and this is where I stop. And that's their authority and that's where they stop. So actually, I would argue it's even bigger than just political parties. And as far as just, just for whom, that then when you start to think about not just stakeholder groupings as in organisational bodies, but start to think about different groups and societies, we are well aware when we are talking about this that what we, we may come on to kind of ecology later on, but then we've got this chronic undersupply of housing and we know the debates that that then comes into that when we start to talk about build housing which we all at the same time agree we've got a chronic undersupply so the complexity within a just transition really is worthy of consideration and I am not suggesting I've got the answers to that I am acknowledging it's extraordinarily complex for us all and perhaps you know we need to work much harder together to augment what uh, Michael had said. Thank you. Manette. Well, I think it, again that the, the main point being, you know, that it has to be a just transition in terms of like, you know, we have to make sure that, um, that jobs are protected and that people whose jobs like rely on, say, for example, you know, companies like Ennius and oil and gas industry are retrained into other areas and that they're not they're not left behind as we move on to, you know, a sort of low carbon type of economy. Um, we need to make sure that we're, you know, not leaving anyone unemployed on, when while this is happening, and you know that, that we need to have a strategy of how we're going to to move forward with this. And I mean, the point I think being how long will this take, and what what do we do in the meantime? I mean, obviously this is a, a process that it's it's like an ongoing process, so it's not like you know you, you would get to the end and that that's it done. There's little bits happen along the way. So the hope would be obviously as we're, we're going through this, we're seeing improvements in, in a number of different areas and all of those improvements in those different areas add up. Um, so, you know, it, it although it doesn't happen overnight, you know, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to wait till the end, if you like, to, to see those improvements. Um, and that's what we would see happen. But in doing it this way and making sure that we, we retrain our workforce and make make sure that um, when we're we're working on new projects, that those jobs are are, are kept in Scotland, and um, because at the moment there's there's an awful lot of like bringing things in from abroad and and what have you, and um, so we have to make sure that we're not doing that, and we we train our own workforce, and you know we make use of people who at the moment are are unemployed or underemployed, or would benefit from like more training or apprenticeships, and I think that would be the way to to see an improvement. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gillian. So I think the key to the question and the and the speed at which we get to a just transition, one of the main things behind that is political will and money. Um, if you have the political will to get there quickly and governments putting money behind that to be able to get there, that's one of the key things. What we do in the meantime, there's a lot of young technologies of around decarbonisation and things like that. And developing those, again, comes down to time and money. Time is something we don't have in this respect because we know we have nine years before we are almost at the point of no return. So speed has to be, has to be of the essence. To pick up on the just element of the just transition, absolutely. These, 
I think somebody mentioned earlier, Ineos is not the same beast as BP used to be. Um, Ineos is a very different, very different thing to what it used to be. And I think, I think as we've seen previously, there, there may always be an element of threatening to withdraw from the site entirely by Ineos, which we've seen and almost attempting to hold the government to ransom. We need to be bold in this in this arena and we need to put our communities and our planet first. We've had a lot of talk about how we decarbonise homes, how we change our behaviour. We're talking about an area that has six of Scotland's big 10 polluters and we're talking about how people change their behaviour and get buses and instead of their cars and things like that. Absolutely, that is intrinsically important to solving the climate crisis. But we can't do that without seriously stepping up and tackling these big polluters and saying, no, we have to move away from oil and gas. We have to move away from the things that are polluting our planet, destroying our environment, so that we don't have a planet to pass on to the next generation. And for me, it is about in the next parliament, which is going to take up five of that nine years that we have, is being bold, being up front and saying we need to do this and we need to commit to this from day one, putting our money where our mouth is and being bold. Thank, thank you. Um, Michael, you've kind of already had a crack at this question. So can we just, is it okay if we just move on to Alison? Yeah, unless you want to say something? Yeah, okay. So Alison next, please. Yeah, I would agree. We don't have time, you know, uh, the workers in the industry, they know that change is coming, they're ready for that change, but we need to give them, we need to give them something to change too. And when you see what the, the, the Scottish Parliament did when they worked collaboratively together, I'm thinking about the debate on the drug deaths and the extra 50 million per year for five years that was agreed after that. I think that the, the, the something like this it is so urgent but it has to be done collaboratively. It has to, uh, collaboratively, it has to be done as a matter of urgency because we can't, we can't, the young people are depending on us. It's a, it is an emergency. There's no, there isn't more, any more time to waste. So it has to be done and we just have to go on with that. We have, we have to really just get a move on. Uh, Michelle, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's just a minor point because I know I've had my shot, but uh, yes, we don't have time. But also we've got a challenge around the money as well. Uh, in June 2019, the United Nations made the assessment of what the estimated finan financial needs were to make a difference. And they estimated it, uh, that it was to be between 5 trillion and 7 trillion a year. And we found 3 trillion so far. So that is why I'm emphasizing how big a nut this is to crack at, at a global level. So thank you. Richard, could I just make one small point, sure. if you don't mind, on this as well? And it's worth keeping in mind when people are saying that we need to put more money into it and we also need to do it uh, as quickly as possible. It's worth keeping in mind the Committee on Climate Change, that are the expert advisory body to government on these matters, said that the 20, uh, the 75% target that had been set, uh, in their view, was unachievable at the present moment on the basis that the technology is not there or is not mature enough yet to be able to deliver that. So this is not, um, uh, money's a challenging aspect to it. Um, there are a whole variety of other challenges around it, but we also need to recognize that actually some of the technology to help to support the transition over a quicker time frame is just simply not there. And it will take a number of years before it's mature enough and stable enough for us to be able to invest in it. What we need to try and do though, is to make sure that Scotland doesn't become a net importer of this technology, that we actually become a base, as that was a mistake that was made back in the 90s with wind. We allowed that technology to go to Denmark. What we need to do is to make sure that we become the net de developer of this technology and also the exporter of the technology in the years ahead, because it will potentially have a massive global demand once that technology reaches a point where it can be commercialised. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we've we've got a lot of questions. I think that um, I'm I was sort of planning to finish this meeting at nine o'clock or shortly after. So I think that um, you know we can either try and sort of rush through all the questions or 
deal with as many as we can in a sort of you know a, a measured sort of way and i think that's probably the best way to go so to try and be brief in your answers but um, i'm afraid if we don't get to answer deal with all the questions you know i think that we, we that, um, i think i think that um, zoom fatigue will set in and we'll have to stop at some stage but anyway um kate next question please yeah, so three people have asked about biodiversity and what your party will do to um, protect and restore local biodiversity. And two people specifically asked about your thoughts on community ownership and land reform as ways to um, address the national and local challenges. Thank you, Austin. Uh, you're, you're muted, I'm afraid. Did somebody else like to go first for a change? um okay uh well what should we do should we do, it, should we do it backwards okay. <laughs> that's, right. that's fair because i know that from another husband it's a shame it's not much fun being first all the time <laughs> no okay right like okay it. well so we'll start yeah. with you alison so we'll start okay. well, I think I'll go, I'll the list yeah well scottish labor we, one of our plans is to plant five thousand hectares of trees every year uh, restore the peatlands and train, we're hoping to train up to 10,000 workers to look after the natural environment, you know, uh, because it's, again, it's a matter of urgency. We've got, if you look all over Scotland, there's, there's large swathes of public land that isn't, isn't looked after, isn't used. For example, land that Scottish water owns. So we need to do something about that. Uh, for example, rewilding, we could, you know, we could make, you know, help the environment to, to, to look after itself and to, to actually become uh, much more fertile and, and, and rich in uh, animals and plants and everything. I'm just thinking about what, what beavers can do if you introduce beavers into an area or like what happened in Yellowstone Park with the, the wolves. But my, my, my more knowledge isn't that great, but that's just my little contribution. Thank you. Uh, Michael. So I think there's a number of factors in terms of biodiversity. Um, uh, we've, um, uh, we've already started the process, which is the biggest process of restoring our peatlands, because we know that can play a very significant part in helping to uh, carbon capture, um, a natural form of carbon capture, uh, with the biggest investment programme ever into, into restoring our peatlands. I think something in reach, I may be wrong here, Richard, but I think something like 80% of all of the trees which are planted in the UK are planted in Scotland because we have a big uh, forestation program, again, which is a key part of our, our climate change strategy going forward. So we need to build on, uh, build on those uh, and to take them forward. I think one of the things that's probably been, I believe, has been a significant shift and as the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, uh, that I've taken forward was to change what was often viewed as being infrastructure to include our natural infrastructure as being a key area that we need to invest in and to develop in the years ahead. And now infrastructure investment in Scotland isn't just about uh, trains or new railway lines or buildings, etc. It also includes our natural infrastructure and how we can protect, sustain and develop it uh, going forward, which uh, we are, I believe, one of a few countries in the world that have taken natural infrastructure into a wider infrastructure definition. So that will play an important part in going forward. And just on the point Alison was making, we already have the introduction of beavers uh, into on the west coast, not in Perthshire. That was not a that wasn't a controlled program, but we have them in the west coast, which is part of a biodiversity program, which is being. Uh, monitored and expanded and we are keen to look to see how that can happen although I must say we don't have any plans with well, SMP don't have any plans we're back in to reintroduce wolves um, uh, at this point although I know there is someone up in the Highlands who wants to bring in some type of wolf park I believe <laughs> um, if they if they can but look um, the, the final point I would make is on the issue of land reform and this is an area where uh, from the SMP's point of view is that we think there is uh, significant unfinished business here uh, we have taken forward over the course of the last decade an ambitious programme to help to support local communities in taking community ownership of their land, some of which have been very successful. Co communities like Gear, etc., who now have land on their islands and been able to use that in a way that reflects their local needs and their local aspirations has been, I think, has been quite inspirational to see. 
And what we want to do is to build upon that. And a key part of doing that is further legislative change. So that's why we've said if the SNP is re-elected to form the next Scottish government, we will introduce a further land reform uh, act in order to make sure that we deliver greater provision for community ownership and also to make sure that we address some of the ongoing issues we have with major landowners and the way in which uh, they control aspects of that land to allow local communities to have greater access to it and also to be able to have ownership of part of it. So there is a need for legislative change because it's an area which I very much feel there is, a, is unfinished business in making sure that we have a much more open, transparent and much more accountable ways in which our, our land is owned in Scotland. Thank you, Michael. Yes, and I, I must say that I think that, uh, it, as you say, it's, it's been great to see what's been happening on some of the islands particularly, but uh, that, mm. that programme needs to extend more uh, to the sort of the, the mainland, although I know it has started. Uh, Gillian. So similarly, we would want to introduce restrictions on over, overseas ownership of land. Land is very concentrated in very few hands in Scotland. Um, we'd like to bring forward a Land Reform Act and review a, the take up of community right to buy. As you said, it's been well used on, on the islands and things, but there have been, there have been issues with it particularly in, in some of the communities I've been speaking to in, in North Lanarkshire. Um, we'd like to restore peatlands, new, introduce new national parks. But for me, one of the things when we talk about di biodiversity, and this might be just a, a pet interest that we always miss, is talking about um, the marine environment and the biodiversity of our, our marine environments. The current Marine Protected Area Network is akin to a paper park at the moment there is not proper protection for the designations we have we need to enhance that from for me there are definitely some of them that should be no take zones we've seen the we've seen the success of the no take zone in Lamlash Bay and the work that um Coast and the community in in Arran have done with that um the we would we'd like to see more protection for our our marine mammals and and really looking at fisheries and the way that we we want fisheries to look going forwards to restore stocks to ensure that these stocks are are sustainable um going forward so my a lot of my interest is bringing the the marine issues and marine biodiversity to the fore but absolutely terrestrial uh, biodiversity is is incredibly important too thank you uh, moving on to monette Okay, just a bit further to what Alison was talking about, um, Scottish Labour is also uh, a plan to introduce a Scottish Conservation Corps um, that would uh, basically train a new workforce dedicated to restoring the natural environments. It would also employ up to 10,000 people, which obviously helps with the job recovery as well. Um, but in addition to that, um, there's always a focus on like you know increasing green space. I think we've seen certainly with the pandemic, how important it is we have green space and people have open spaces to get out and, and walk about and get the, the fresh air. I think that's been the sort of the saving grace for everyone. Um, you know, and certainly um, an, a new approach to development where uh, we're putting that sort of public health and environment in, in, in the forefront. Um, and, and part of that is like a, a, a national housing agency, which would be uh, responsible for like acquisition of like you know sort of land and housing and dealing with derelict and, and vacant land and making sort of good use of that and good use of the delivery of, of housing and sustainable environments and places you know proper places for people to live um, with proper diversity of like plant life and as, as we're talking about as well and diversity of species which is so important and um, so that, that's really sort of a, a main focus. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, excellent uh, points made here uh, from a number of uh, contributors. We've touched on some of the, the main ones. And I'd add in terms of land reform, um, we've, we've ended up where we are by accident, if you like. 
by failure to tackle some of these challenges and it really is long overdue and of course we can't forget the historic use and development of land and how we use the land and how it's contributed to our environmental challenges definitely agree with Gillian about uh, marine development very strong and community ownership the thing I would add as well that I noticed came up in the chat function we're all trying to affect change, whether it's within the Scottish Government or whether it's uh, in political parties where we have areas of agreement, uh, but we need to use all the resources we have, and that's not just top down in terms of government and laws, it's also bottom up. So one of the, the things that came up in the chat that I picked up on is increased use, which I know obviously the SNP plan to do, thankfully, of citizens' assemblies, because citizens' assemblies don't just give good ideas and sentiment about how people are thinking and feeling. They are a way of growing engagement and buy-in. And that's very important because we know how effective lobbyists can be to whip up a storm about X parties wants to do this and it's going to affect these people, but getting buy-in so that people really understand why this is so important. So that's something that I think I'm pleased to see that the SNP is going to actively use a, a great deal more and indeed set up. Thank you. And I, yes, I'm very glad that you mentioned citizens' assemblies. I think that's a, a, yes, a, a very important kind of development. Uh, Austin. I think about coming last, you can say what a good set of ideas. I largely agree with all of them, but I have a couple of points. One is this idea of community buying, uh, allowing the community to buy things. It sounds very good, and in many cases it may well be good, but there's a slight wrinkle. I think what's happening in, in Falkirk is the council, understandably, is trying to get rid of a lot of liabilities. So in Bowness, we have a nice town hall, has not been maintained for donkey's years, and they are now saying, why does the community buy this lovely building and use it? And we think it's a, it's a council responsibility. We think they should be maintaining it and, and seeing its use. Why should it pass it on to a local community? So that, that's a council issue and want to develop it further. If I may be allowed one slightly less serious point at the end, as I walk around canvassing, I'm horrified at a lack of diversity in people's front lawns. There's artificial being put ground down all over the place. So if I get to Parliament, the first thing I'll do is pass a bill saying it'll be a hundred £10,000 fine for having artificial grass in your front lawn. You've got to tear it up and put ground, ground ordinary grass and shrubs and trees. That's be the requirement and be increased biodiversity that way. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, right, uh, Kate, next question. Yeah, I think this is probably the last one. Um, a couple of people wanted to know about it. So Alexander Dennis, the bus manufacturer, is a hugely important in Falkirk as an employer and providing the technologies that we need to reduce emissions and change our transport system. If your party was in government, how would you ensure that electric buses and other electric vehicles are built locally and benefit the local area rather than brought in from abroad? Uh, right, we'll, we'll carry on um, in the order we've, the, the reverse order. So, um, Alison, would you like to go first, please? Alison, you're muted. Uh, Alison, can you hear me? Don't, I don't it's... Yeah. No, she's not. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not muted. Can you hear me? No, we can. We, we can now. Yes, carry on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, being honest, I don't really know the answer to that question, but what I think is it's a moral obligation the, the Scottish government would have to make sure that the buses were, were the, the buses that we need uh, to go forward and low carbon. Uh, we need to we need to make them in Scotland. We need to continue to do that. I mean, I can't imagine any other any other way we would do it. We really need to stop. Uh, bringing in from abroad, as I said before, wind turbines, we, we, we manufacture them, or they're manufactured abroad and brought in. We need to stop that. We need to start, we need to build up our manufacturing base, create more jobs here. We need to make sure that we keep, uh, if, we need to, if we need to have stuff, we need to make it here. Uh, that's, that's, I, mean, I don't know any, any other way to answer it apart from say that. But I'm not in government, so it's easy for me to say that. <laughs> 
Right, thank you. Thank you for being honest. Uh, Michael. Well, look, this is an extremely important issue and it's been a really challenging time for Alexander Dennis over the course of the last 12 to 14 months, uh, given the big drop off there has been in orders because of the restrictions in public transport and uh, the impact that then has on uh, investing in new fleets. And one of the things which um, I've taken forward is again is the, 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 the transport secretary is investing in the decarbonising of our transport system. And that's why over the course of this year alone, we have invested a record amount of money in the decarbonisation of the bus fleet with the most recent of them just back about six weeks ago, which was over £40 million in the Scottish Ultra Low Emission Bus Fund Scheme, which is uh, delivering over 200 new, 215 new decarbonised uh, zero emission buses, uh, the vast majority of which will be manufactured right here in Falkirk and which will be delivered by Alexander Dennis, building on the investment that we made um, a number of months earlier uh, to with about £20 million on another programme through the, so the, the, the Scottish Ultra Low Emission Bus Fund. So uh, it's an absolutely critical element of decarbonising our public transport system, but it's also important that we benefit from the expertise and the skills that we have at a company like Alexander Dennis's, and that's why the Scottish Government stepped straight in to provide this funding to try and help to support the industry and to deliver that decarbonisation agenda and the orders which are now going into Alexander Dennis as a result of the funding which the Scottish Government has made available. And um, one of the benefits of that, as um, when I was discussing it with the Managing Director, or the new managing director at Alexander Dennis is that allowed them to remove any 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 risk of redundancies this year uh, because of the funding which was made available by the Scottish uh, government. So we want to build on that and to capitalise on that, and we've actually got further discussions we're having with Alexander Dennis and how we can make sure that we don't just get the benefit of this initial order, but that we make sure that Falkirk becomes a global centre for uh, technology around the decarbonisation of the public. Uh, bus fleet. So this is a, a hugely ambitious program that the Scottish Government is taking forward, not just with Alexander Dennis's, but actually also with the energy companies, uh, because we need to make sure the grid infrastructure is there to help to support bus companies and be able to move to electric buses. So part of the funding that we provide is also to put in the infrastructure so that they can move to electric battery operated buses as well, and we work with Scottish Power and Energy and also with the Scottish and Southern Energy. And my final point, Richard, on this would be is that um, I was talking to a, I was talking to um, a, a, an individual, a senior individual within the bus industry in, uh, in England, who had pointed out to the UK government there are now more electric buses operating in the town of on the town of Kilmarnock than there are operating in the whole of England as a result of the investment that's been made by the Scottish Government to help to support the decarbonisation of the fleet. So that's the type of ambition we want, and that's why I've been absolutely determined over the course of the last year to make sure we did everything to support that company, and we can now see that being translated into the jobs that are being saved as a result because of the investment we've made in uh, electric battery buses and uh, Alexander Dennis is securing the order. Thank you. That's good. Uh, Gillian. So as well as the buses being built at Alexander Dennis, Falkirk has to benefit from them as well. The number of buses that I've seen running around Falkirk that are nearly 10, more than 10 years old is incredible. They are very polluting old buses that are idling in Newmarket Street and in other places around Falkirk. The bus system in Falkirk at the moment is a shambles. It would be better in public hands, in my in my view, and it would be better being run by the local authority for the benefit of local people. It would end the subsidisation of, of routes that means that bus companies just keep sticking routes together so that they're bigger and bigger. Some of the buses that go around, go around parts of Grangemouth and things feel like they take a year to get where they're supposed to be going. And that's that's something we need to we need to solve as well. But I think even if we are 
even if we are making that investment in Alexander Dennis, which is fabulous because it's saving local jobs, it's investing in in uh, local apprenticeships and things like that as well. We need to make sure that our communities benefit from the, benefit from the buses and that we have the bus infrastructure that we need as well. The current um, set up with bus stops around Newmarket Street and around the 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 one way system is dangerous at points at the moment. Um, there's no room for social distancing on some of the pavements at some of these bus stops and the some of the accessibility, particularly for disabled people, isn't great either. So absolutely invest in Alexander Dennis, but let's make sure that Falkirk and the surrounding area gets the gets the benefit from those electric buses as well. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, Monette, if you're next. Uh, yep, yeah, just further to what uh, Gillian was saying there, there, there is um, a real problem with buses in the area. I mean, there's just not, uh, some of the buses are so old that they can they can barely get up a hill. You know, you get stuck behind one of those really smelly old buses. It's really not not nice. And um, there really aren't the, the buses available for people to like to get to sort of the further, further flung areas in, in Falkirk. So again, having uh, you know green buses is great, but you really need to have them running in the area. Um, I mean, certainly there was there was a lot of um, jobs lost last year with Alexander Dennis, um, and I mean it's really you know positive that you know that the, they've they've got this contract, but we really need to see some benefits from that. And I mean it was the UK government's uh, bus back better program that pr produced funding in order to secure that, and and that's really good news, but. We really need to be, be seeing more of that being used within our, our local areas, some more green, nice new buses that are not polluting us and causing problems. OK, I, I, I think that one of the kind of um, things that uh, occurs to me when talking about that sort of thing, I mean, I absolutely agree with all that. But the trouble is that if you're um, you have this sort of trade-off that if, if you buy a whole load of new buses, the environmental cost of building those buses and disposing of the, of the old ones, you know, that has to be factored into the equation. So it's 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 not always just as simple as that. But, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I absolutely get your point. Um, Michelle, I think you're next. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, good stuff um, said so far. I suppose I, I would just kind of add to the the points being made uh, thus far. Uh, manufacturing, uh, manufacturing in the UK, we know, is traditionally very low since it became a service economy. It's about uh, 10%. And I'm pleased to see and point out to you in the SNP manifesto about an active commitment to growing our manufacturing industry. Uh, and setting up of a national manufacturing uh, institute. And also to kind of point out to you as well, the setting up of the, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Challenge Fund. And what that, that is about is investing 26 million to support the development of robust supply chains in low carbon industries. And this was music to my ears because we tend to talk at quite a high level these things of the what without thinking about the how and the supply chains to develop end-to-end uh, -end delivery and manufacturing are vitally important. And actually the, the UK has become an assembly unit, if you like, like they used to, when I was in Westminster, used to talk a lot about the kind of car industry. There isn't a car industry, they, they assemble cars in some bits, some places, and they don't even do that now. So supply chains are vitally important. And the other thing I would say is skills as well. You have to grow the skills, your, your kind of skills base alongside the supply chains. Now, Scotland, it, it, we do really well in terms of our skills comparators with the, the rest of the world. We are up there, but we know there's a lot more to do and there will be a particular focus on looking at the skills that are needed as we move forward from the COVID uh, pandemic. And lastly, creating an entrepreneurial uh, culture and environment for our small business, vitally important. We know over 99% of our businesses are SME. This is where our recovery is going to come from. These are the guys that will create supply chains that we need. Oh, 
Oh, oh, sorry, was I still muted? Sorry, but beg your pardon. Austin, you're next. Largely, the point I was going to make have been covered. I think Michael mentioned the need for management, for government support, for infrastructure. <clears throat> Michelle mentioned the need for, need for training. <clears throat> I'm not sure that we have actually a world-class position in terms of the level of training we have available. I think our technical training in, in the colleges needs to be upgraded. I think it actually is not that good. So I think the training, especially in new technologies, is, needs, need, needs attention. The other thing which I just wanted to say is in terms of transport, the discussion went into the area of how we provide good transport. And the point is, do we just replace it all for new? I think one of the things which the Lib Dems are arguing for is an integrated system of transport, whereby buses and trains and even barges and, 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 and ferries are integrated and have a, one system organizing it all. So they have, um, including fare systems. So I think that would be really useful and the point being made that it'd be helpful to have the local authority involved in that, because they would then provide transport for the local area. I think those are things which would be very helpful. That would like to help this particular bus company, but I think the other, other points made have already addressed how it could be helped. We haven't exported stuff for a long time, but up, up until recently, there's a bus company in Balamina, which is producing buses for Hong Kong. So it is possible but maybe we're now only an assembly plant rather than a production and exporting plant. And that, that, that's maybe true, but sad. Right. Thank you very much. I think that's at that point, I think we need to, to bring this, this meeting to a close. Um, there have been some, I, I've been sort of keeping a, a, a quick eye on the chat, and there have been a lot of very good questions that I'm afraid we haven't been able to deal with and, and some points made. So perhaps we can, can we leave the, the Zoom open for a few minutes so people who want to can read through the chat. I also noticed that uh, Alison, who's been having d d um, technical problems with Zoom uh, all evening, has uh, offered to, um, she's put a telephone number in the chat and she's offered to um, talk to anybody who wants to on her phone about the 20 minute neighbourhoods that we haven't had really a time to, to, to get on to. So I think that um, at that point, can I say thank, thank you very much to all the candidates who've given your evening to this meeting. It's been a, a very good, uh, I think, a very good and interesting debate. I've been, um, and I've, I've been sort of very encouraged. I think that, um, as, as, as you know, many people have said, there's, there's an awful lot to do. It's going to be very hard. But I think that, you know, there is a kind of that sort of broad spectrum of political opinion that um, that we need to, to just get on, on and do it. Um, so I uh, thank you very much uh, also um, to Sarah and Kate for, for helping with me with uh, what kind of organizing the meeting. And um, thank you to all of those uh, of you who attended. So um, I think at, at that we shall wrap up. But as I say, we'll, we'll leave the screen open if any, if, so people can just have a look at what's been put on the chat. Thank you. And we say thank you to you for organizing this, for running it. It's a very useful thing you've done. And I personally have enjoyed it. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Yeah, it's made me think a lot. And I know that I've, I've got a lot more to learn. So I'm going to be doing that. <laughs>